All right, so here is one in hopefully a long series of videos, or rather talks, lectures, podcasts, uh, old school, <laughs> old school YouTube videos where you know some guy just rambles on forever about stuff that you know people put in the background while they're playing video games. Uh, for many years, I denied uh, this. <laughs> I denied the sense of being a YouTuber. I mean, I think because I don't like the sound of my own voice. I mean, everyone does metaphorically love the sound of their own voice. But I mean, I think that I have, I don't know, not a good voice. It's only until I became a regular or more than a regular. I don't know. <laughs> on Break the Rules podcast that I realized that, you know, people can tolerate my voice for more than a few minutes. And that gives me some sense of ease with which uh, I can base a judgment on my ability to be, you know, putting content out on YouTube or bitch shoot or whatever. Uh, I, so, you know, it's, it's funny because for many years I watched YouTube fastidiously every single day every single hour whether it's music or lectures or podcasts or videos but it's it's just that i don't know i never saw myself being a quote unquote youtuber but i guess that people are telling me that blogging is dead and instead you're going to have to either publish a book which i you know hope to do many ebooks or semi-professional books or you have to be you know a youtuber where you're playing this game and i really didn't want to talk about being you know on a meta level something or other because i do consider myself primarily when i'm not an artist i'm a writer right uh essayist i guess you could say uh so but I feel that, you know, when I started my blog, that it would be comfortable and I could write shorter things and, you know, I didn't conceive of it as putting pressure on myself the way that, you know, writing usually does. But in a sense, I have placed that pressure on myself. And this is why I feel it's time to just pop the cherry, you know, break the seal, get it over with on being a YouTuber and putting out content. But I feel that I should focus more on art and art criticism and my own personal art on YouTube. And maybe like some political ramblings here and there. But what I wanted to talk about today is I wanted to sort of have a good introduction to this series of extending my original blogging series, Modern Art Madness, into YouTube. And it started off with tweeting out my sort of distaste for a lot of YouTubers who get really big and, and uh, recognizable on doing film analysis. And there's, you know, some good people that do it and a lot of trash. But I feel that it's, you know, cheap and easy content because everyone watches movies and it's a set narrative and it's easily relatable and it's easy to mine philosophic tidbits from uh, movie analysis, film analysis. But I feel that in even the better ones, I mean, okay, a lot of them tend to be libs, but whatever, besides the point. A lot of them, they try to mine philosophic points from films. And unless you're watching uh, professionally made art documentaries, such as the Perspectives uh, BBC controlled product or that YouTube channel from PBS... It seems that there's not a lot of YouTubers that are actually analyzing visual art. I mean, there's some, but then those are like one-off videos or they're attached to music or films, which are like, again, normie clickbait. I feel that visual art, <laughs> along with the decay of society, visual art not being on the capstone of all of the arts anymore is a sign of social decay. And film, the moving image, and music... Not that I, you know, I am a fastidious, you know, watcher of good cinema and I'm a, 
lifelong fan of various forms of music, but, you know, and I have a lot of friends who are musicians and so forth, but I feel that my thing, visual art, it's become either like kitsch that people pay attention to for a few seconds on Instagram, or it's become like this super like caw, what I mean by caw, C-A-W, contemporary art world, type of pretentious thing that very few people, uh, like very few normies have a grasp of. And every time YouTubers talk about uh, visual art, they're usually talking about in relation to another like popular art form, either film, you know, cinema or <laughs> cinema or music, or it's like a one-off thing where, ooh, look at these creepy paintings. The guy who, uh, and it was a good documentary, the guy who did the, uh, the analysis of the, the Caretakers albums and, uh, the visual artist who does a lot of, uh, who's friends with the, uh, you know, the, the musicians that, that do that project. And I think it was, uh, Solar Sands. But anyways, there's not a lot of channels that go out of their way to, like, take a one-off piece of, um, of visual art the way that, you know, people have, like, analysis of films or albums like i don't want to be like the anthony fantano <laughs> of like painting although that would be nice if i like had the reach of like an absolute cretin lowbrow uh anyways I i'm not gonna get into that but <laughs> what i wanted to talk about to kick off this series of extending modern art madness or and i may change the term because it's not like there's that delineation between modern and contemporary art. But what I wanted to do is analyze um, one of my favorite or rather few favorite paintings. But it's very hard to choose because he's one of my favorite artists of all time. Uh, one of my favorite paintings by Anselm Kiefer, which is called The Orders of the Night. Die Orden der Nacht. Uh, 1996 and he painted a few of these there's some sketches of the same singular male figure in the foreground and if you go to which i will link in the description my blog post from modern art madness week i believe the second week which was last year or the year before uh usually in december i'll have a whole week where i put out one uh modern art madness every single day although <laughs> So you'll get maybe like five or six of them, to be brutally honest. But this one I analyzed um, what what's called uh, Renowned Order of the Night, which is the, the one from, uh, the one that was made after this one. So this, so that was the Renowned Order of the Night, and that was the one where the man is uh, underneath the stars. But this one, the Orders of the Night, is, I believe, the earlier one. And the Orders of the Night depicts, as you can see, I'll put it, you know, a clip show here. It depicts a man, a singular figure, the same figure, lying on the ground, looking to the sky. And in the renowned Orders of the Night, he's looking at the night sky. And I describe how Anselm Kiefer wants to really get at the heart of all mythos and at the heart of all profound um, spiritual experiences after a sort of collapse of all signifiers and all common cultural archetypes and econotypes. And this is similar in that man is searching for the new, but not the new in a sense that, you know, wigs and progressives and you know, what would you call them, shit libs, or, you know, the nihilistic types that usually <laughs> occupy the halls of the contemporary art world and the galleries and the universities. All of those people who have terminally, like, radical liberal, and they like to call it Marxist, but they have terminally radical liberal uh, politics, and they have this, like, very crippling notion of Whig history, that history is like this infinite line that goes upwards, what Anselm Kiefer is doing is that he's trying to reconcile the horrors of, that he was born into of post-war period Germany. And, you know, right after uh, Germany had to confront its own past. And, of course, Germany, because of its situation, uh, was always a product of its traditions and its past and its uh, 
mutual um, understanding through, you know, the German ideas of this primordial tradition. And Oswald Spangler goes into this because of uh, the way that Germany was structured and the land, the geographic land base it was in. It had to really have this form of, well, he called it Prussian socialism, but really it was a form of primordial collectivism that the Anglos lacked because they were an island seafaring nation that developed a lot of libertarian ideas because of it. But the German, the German ideology, you know, Frederick Nietzsche talks about this as well. But in essence, Anselm Kiefer is trying to reconcile the past, but unlike a lot of other contemporary artists, and, and he's so great and he's so special uh, for a number of reasons, like <laughs> just for the mere fact that he may have an army of studio hands in his like ridiculously large like air hangar uh, studio in France, but he basically still paints everything himself. And that sets him apart because that, you know, even that little acknowledgement of the past of art making and visual art and the history of painting is enough for him to break out of the mold of this sort of perspectival postmodern. Not that there's anything wrong with it. I mean, I'll, as time goes on, I'll go into my more nuanced takes of postmodernism and postmodern art. But what sets him apart is that he really still finds meaning in primordial tradition, but in a way that isn't clouded by the ideologies of, you know, well, rather isn't clouded by the, the movements of failed ideologies and the bricklage of German history in the 20th century. And it's really, he wants to find a way, in my opinion, to escape the cudgel and in, in the sort of yoke of that, you know, sense of monumental uh, failure and shame and regret and NUI and liberal guilt that comes with, you know, modern, postmodern Germany today. And the way he does this is interesting because he is a figurehead at the cusp of postmodern art. He is a visionary and a leader. But the way he does this, and I quote, and this is from uh, the artsy article on him. Uh, it's very hard to find unbiased resources in contemporary art, obviously, because all of them have this like knee-jerk progressivism, especially in the age of Trump, Orange Man, that they have this like sense of knee-jerk, like critical theory and and uh, stuff like that. But you know bracketing all of that i don't want this to be like i don't you know as people people who know me know that i don't want this to be like a fucking brain dead paul joseph watson oh uh, this this is this is uh not a representation this is just lines on a canvas and this is uh this is a cultural marxism anyway so <laughs> I'm pretty sure that maybe Paul Joseph Watson would uh, be more forgiving to Anselm because there's at least some representation there. But then he would be like, oh, well, he's a self-hating German and he's talking about the Holocaust. And uh, I don't know. I Well, Paul Joseph not Watson isn't exactly like, you know, I don't know what you would call them. Wignat. I mean, Wignat's such an overplayed term, but he's not. He's like all light. I don't know, but then there's people like Jacob Geller and other, like, fil again, film analysis people that think, you know, Paul Just Watson's a Nazi because he hates modern art. But, you know, Paul Just Watson doesn't even know the difference between modern and contemporary art. But that's besides the point. I, again, I can't escape politics. So, anyways, Anselm Kiefer says, and this is from the uh, artsy article.net. Uh, Germans want to forget the past and start a new thing all the time. But only by going into the past can you go into the future. So that's very interesting here. So it goes on to explain uh, Kiefer's critically engages with myth and memory, referencing totems of German culture and collective history. So there's a lot of um, Volkish symbolism in a lot of his paintings. Uh, you know, Kiefer's epic scaled, dense sculptures and paintings are often exposed to elements like acid, fire, and incorporate materials such as lead, burned books, concrete... Uh, three branches, ashes, um, various installation pieces. And what he'll do is he will um, purposefully 
paint in such a way as to clump together oil painting and to not follow the, you know, fat over lean rules if you know about painting, meaning that you have to, um, I'm not an oil painter, I'm an acrylic and, uh, other mediums, but I mostly use acrylic, um, when I'm not printmaking. And what fat over lean means is you need, um, fat layers of paint, meaning that you need paint with a lot of medium, which is usually linseed oil, or it's usually a mix of linseed oil, turpentine, and well, some other sort of spirit thinner or alkyd. They have like a bunch of different mediums, but essentially you want to have thinner layers of paint with less medium in it and more dryers in them underneath. And you want to have uh, layers of f what they call fat paint or paint with a lot of medium or a lot of linseed oil uh, above because you want to have an even sort of sequence of drying or else the paintings will chip and will be uh, subject to a lot of different environmental damage. Acrylic uh, painting is different because you don't have to follow any rule like that. But anyways, so Kiefer he'll purposefully paint in this very uh, haphazard way because he intentionally wants to break down paintings and so he'll expose canvases to the weather and he'll do d d various things like uh, put them out in the sun expose them to uv and then he'll crack off whole layers of just the bricklage and then he'll save pieces and he'll glue them together and i've done some of that with like paint scrapings myself uh of course, trying to LARP and some Kiefer, but he'll do these various things uh, in order to what the documentary on him from, I believe it was Brilliant Ideas, uh, the series on, on BNN, described the way his process works. He wants to really capture the motion of the cosmos, of breaking down and coming together and conglomerating on this uh, unique spectrum of time because it's very difficult to convey a sense of temporality and, and you know and in this sense he's you know one of the only painters I wouldn't say one of the only but one of the most striking example of a painter that is a Heideggerian fundamentally because Kiefer is imbued with the sense of temporality where where Dasein recognizes the cycles of history and the cycles of time being this process of decay and then coming together and then mimicking the the elementary particles of the cosmos and through the swirling together of decay new life can be created so Anselm Kiefer experienced this nihilistic thanatos at the end of his civilization with the end of the third reich and he wanted to convey the sense of decay starting anew and so this is what um you know and so in in, in this review he says uh you know casper david french's romantic landscapes he plays with that idea of the german the teutonic romantic landscape basically the volkish kitsch that the nazis embraced that susan sontag talked about um, Kabbalah mysticism, Cold War politics, National Socialist architecture, um, Paul Salon's seminal body of post-Holocaust poetry, art is difficult, he says, it's not entertainment. So um, Anselm Kiefer in this painting, uh, The Orders of the Night, so here we have emulsion, shellac, acrylic, and if you know about the process, you know that uh, sh I, if, I believe shellac and acrylic can work together. But enamel and acrylic can't. And so so Kiefer is experimenting and he really does not care about the archival value of his paintings because it's not about that. The fact that paintings decay and change color because he's infused uh, certain metallic uh, mediums into the paint structure and he's uh, oxidized them unevenly. And so the colors change and the oils break down. And even putting um, acrylic over emulsion paint, that will inevitably decay in certain spots and chip away. And he really doesn't care about, you know, people like me. I, of course, care about the archival quality of my, you know, paintings. But he really doesn't have that sort of egoism about it. It's really, you know, the fact that a painting can break apart during a show is really 
his goal. It's his, um, and of course, conservators, they, they, you know, they, this is nightmarish to them, but he finds this guilty pleasure in like terrorizing these conservators who like hand them, you know, hand him boxes of materials that have fallen off his artworks. So this painting, it depicts the same figure of a half naked man. He just has a pair of pants on and he is balding. So he's an older gentleman, middle-aged and it's very insignificant because it's almost in the middle period of history. Again, another Heideggerian notion of Dasein or the, the human, you know, being with, uh, you know, being towards death, whatever you, you know, whatever you may. It's in the middle all the time. It's, again, you know, Deleuze has a similar notion of being within double articulation or being in the middle of a process, never starting the way that Descartes started with the cogito, I think, therefore I am, cogito ergo sum. It's always in the middle of existence. It is what Heidegger called the throwness of being. So this man is thrown into these post-apocalyptic scenes in middle age, and he is experiencing the profound death of every single archetype and every single econotype. And again, read John David Ebert's uh, brilliant book, and hopefully on Break the Rules, we can interview him one day. Uh, brilliant book, Art After Metaphysics. So Kiefer is the painter of the middle. He is a Heideggerian in the sense that he is painting within an experience, within a collapse, within a process of nature and the cosmos and the human soul. And, and it's always what Heidegger called care, which is throwness produces care because, and, and care means that you have a certain comportment and a certain attachment to the processes of things that are going on. So what Kiefer is doing is he's depicting this man within middle age, and that's very symbolic of this, you know, middle period, this within a process of decay and subsequent rebirth. And instead of like in the other painting, he's not looking at the cosmos now. He's looking at um, depictions, crude depictions of uh, sunflowers black sunflowers so sunflowers they fallow and then they regrow and there's sunflower fields and these are sunflowers that have decayed and are dying but they will pop up again and you can see this illustrious uh post-impressionist uh owing a debt to the impressionist impressionists <laughs> owing a debt to the impressionists um tapestry of canvas where there's layers that are you know, thickly painted and glued on and scraped off and withered away and grayed down. And it's a very enigmatic canvas full of life. So even in a scene of profound death of all meanings, of all cultural narratives, of all mythos, Kiefer wants to get back to the original chaos and vitality and creation and rebirth that has borne all mythologies and all symbols and all um, human bricklage in the collective unconscious. He wants to, you know, and, and some people, some very um, short-sighted people, put it that way, they look at this and they're like, well, this is nihilism. But Kiefer is not a nihilist. Kiefer is a, you know, trying to get out a cosmic significance of the man the most primordial experience that you can ever get at, which is a man looking up at the stars for the first time, or a man looking up from a poppy, f or not a poppy field, from a sunflower field at the for the first time. A man looking up and seeing the possibilities and the potentialities of all existence, and can see again with new eyes the stirring of the soul. And so Kiefer, he's saying, among the ruins, there is a new potentiality that man has to totally be devoid and separated from all that has left him. All of meaning, all of signification, all of religion, all of culture, all of art itself. Man has to go through this total apocalypse 
And to me, I think of this middle-aged man as going through as one of the last survivors of civilization. And this is what Kiefer is getting at. Kiefer is seeing that our world is dying, our world is decaying, and after the decay, there are remnants of hope that once again, like, you know, thousands upon thousands, perhaps millions of years ago, man can finally look up at the stars or look at the sunflowers again and experience a rebirth. And of course, the sunflowers are a symbol of the sun itself. So, you know, basic platonic philosophy of the sun is the allegory, the metaphor for the good. The good is the form that gives light to all the other forms. The sun is that which gives light analogously to every other experience because we can't see anything without light and light all comes from the sun. This is like the, you know, classic, you know, Plato's Republic argument, book set, book six, whatever, right? So the, the sunflower is imbued with the symbol of rebirth and with the sun. It gives illumination, but notice how the flowers here are dead and decayed, but man has to look up at them anyways, and he has to see the potential seeds within the decayed husks of the sunflowers. And so this painting is so powerful. And to me, it really symbolizes if I had to take just one painting um, or a couple paintings of, of Kiefer's body of work over many, many years, I would pick this one and I would pick the first one, um, The Orders of the Night, because it really goes to show you... Um, when an artist does philosophy right, but also does mythology right. And so here, the man is looking up at the decay, and you can really see at the canvas that there is nothing left. There is nothing but rubble. There's nothing but the bricklage of history itself. And he, you know, lies down on the ground, and he finally sees the possibilities in the new and so Kiefer is not one of these, again, one of these brain dead like Whig history people. He is really seeing something more profound. He's saying that you have to go into the past. You have to go into the most primordial of experiences in order to make anything new. You can't short stop it. You can't deny it. You can't cut the human off from the past. You have to reconcile with it. And so Kiefer over the years has been accused. And, you know, of course, when he was younger... He would do photo series where he's like giving a middle finger to certain places and he's, uh, you know, giving the, uh, <laughs> the Roman salute. Uh, <laughs> but so he's been accused of being a Nazi or, um, a Nazi sympathizer and really in the German art world, like any, anything to do with any stitch of tradition is immediately hit with suspect. Like even just wanting to join the military in Germany nowadays is seen as suspect. And it's, they, they've gotten rid of whole special forces units because they're like, these people could be like Nazis, you know, because they want to like defend their country. That's Nazism. But Kiefer like fundamentally embodies the most radical form of traditionalism there is. You know, what did, I don't mean to LARP, and I know it's kind of cringe, but it's like Julius Evola, um, Evola, Ev Evola, as my great friend uh, Adam Wallace used to say, Julius Evola, the most radical ideology, the most revolutionary politics of our time is tradition. So Kiefer really embodies that. He is traditionalist artist, qua tradition, because he is going and aiming for the most primordial of all tradition, that original moment of awe that he's trying to depict. And so he's not like these like vulgar tradist like paintings of like you know the hellenistic civilization that were painted in the 19th century by academic and romanticist painters academicism uh they're not like you know fucking thomas kincaid vulgar like tr what i call vulgar tradism which i will have a video against uh thomas kincaid but also i i i've had all write an article about you know explaining what i mean by vulgar tradism it's just like you know this very comfortable like white suburbia of the 1950s and it's like you know the boomers had norman rockwell and now like millennials who like read julius avila like and, you know like myself like they 
uh, you know, they think like Thomas Kincaid is like the best thing because Bob Ross is too normie for people. So it's gotta be like Thomas Kincaid and, <laughs> and he's like the Norman Rockwell. And it's funny. I'm seeing this like online on Twitter, this like tratification of Thomas Kincaid, even though it's like soulless catch, but not to fault the guy. He was, you know, he had his flaws and he was a Christian and he was all right. I mean, he was a Baptist or something like that. I don't know. But like he, um, he did a painting for Billy Graham. Uh, he, you know, but to get back to the point, I'm getting sidetracked with politics with stupid nonsense again. But to get the point, you know, Anselm Kiefer, I, you know, the, the vulgar tradists like Paul Joseph Watson. This is where I kind of agree with Jacob Geller's video on Paul Joseph Watson. Not that I agree with him to say that Paul Joseph Watson's a fascist or whatever. Because, like, these fucking people that, like, I think he works for Kotaku. These people wouldn't know fascism if it hit him in the head, right? They don't, they don't, they, they wouldn't know fascism if they even read, like, I don't know, the Doctrine of Fascism or Mussolini's Intellectuals or, you know, not to say I'm so much better than them, whatever. But, like, the, the thing is, they're right in the sense that Paul Joseph Watson and people like that, that, you know, the trad Western art types... They don't really uh, have a sense of what contemporary art is trying to get at. You know, they don't really have a sense of what a lot of modern art explicitly was trying to get at. Because within modern art, there was the seeds of the anti-modern. And hopefully I can write more about this and I could talk more about this on here. But this is, Kiefer is the perfect illustration of this. Kiefer is an artist that Paul Joseph Watson would look like and he'd be like, well, it's all crud. I mean, he's just gluing things to the canvas. But it's more than that. It's trying to be a traditionalist and a profoundly anti-traditionalist universe, which is the contemporary art world, the Ka. And the way he does it is by um, finding clever ways to destroy any sort of insinuations and, and you know, any sort of goose-stepping millenarian ideologies that weren't exactly traditionalist to begin with, the way that, you know, the, the perennialists talked about primordial tradition. Uh, but that being said, Kiefer, he is using the tools of postmodernism to get at very anti-modern conclusions. Even Frederick Jameson in, uh, you know, postmodernism or the logic of late capitalism, uh, postmodernism or the cultural logic of late capitalism, even he says that there are seeds of reactionary thought within the postmodern. And, you know, to a Mark, to a, like a classic Marxist like him, that's obviously a problem. And it's a really great book and all that. But Kiefer, he embodies this sense of reactionary thought going in through the back door. And if the vulgar trads, they analyze the contemporary world for more than a few milliseconds to say it's degenerate, it's trash, it's Jewish, it's this, it's that. It's if they really, you know thought for a second if they were to bracket that a lot of contemporary art is basically just like woke propaganda and it's run by certain you know people that you know i'm not going to say it's run by certain people but you know what i mean like it's run by an agenda it's run by like a very um an ideology that's very antithetical to any sort of sense of traditionalism if they were to do that then they would see that Anselm Kiefer is, is trying to deliver humanity towards a future that is more in line with what an actual traditionalist future would look like than, like, I don't know, like, 13-year-old white girls going to the mall and, like, talking about boys in the 1950s. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> Anselm Kiefer is doing something very unique and very interesting, and he should be paid attention to. Because this piece in particular, it's in the ashes of the wake, man still has a capacity for awe and still has a religious wonder. But Kiefer acknowledges, in my opinion, that the only way to deliver us back into the sense of awe is if we destroy every single predicate that we had at one point. If we get past all of our conscious criticisms, as Young called it, getting through all of our rationalist pretensions, but also all of our ideological uh, bricklage and, and baggage and really, d you know, uncouple ourselves from all of the machinations of society. Because these paintings are very primitivist in the sense, and I know primitivism, like, you know, I agree with the critical theory people here that it's a bad word. Not a bad word, but rather it's a, um, it's a word loaded with connotations. 
And in a sense, it's primitive in that it's getting at something that is beyond our own comprehension. To see things with totally new eyes, without total criticisms and prejudices that we've built up as a product of our civilization and the trajectory and history that we've subjected ourselves to. And this is the primordial tradition that I believe the Prentice were talking about. It's something that trads nowadays, it's hard to admit, it's, you know, I'm being one of them. It's hard to admit that you're just as much a product of modernity as everyone else. And you're just as much a product of the modern world. And you have these pretensions that you're trying to fight against. And you have these, you know, sort of your goggles are painted. Your view is painted and colored by the common experiences that we all have in hyper-capitalist, techno-modernity, globalized world globo-liberalism, neoliberalism. And it's very hard to, like, divorce ourselves completely from the system itself, but also more intangibly from the images of thought and the prejudices and the operational manual assumptions and programming, if you will, that lies behind the modern world. And it's very difficult. And the way you can do that is by acknowledging that you are just a person and you don't have this godlike ability to see past the pretensions and see behind the curtains of everything. And the only way we're going to really truly get back at any traditionalist form of not just society, but also a traditionalist mindset would be after a profound act of uncoupling and destruction and chaos. And Kiefer is saying that after the chaos, we can finally look up at the stars, at the, at the sunflower fields. And we can finally look up at the sun and we can see potentialities and we can start anew. And it's not starting anew the way the millenarians want to, the way the communists want to, the way the Whig liberals want to, where their version is like this year zero, like technocratic society of like, you know, you're going to forget the past. You're going to live in a pod. You need the bugs, you know. But you're going to more or less forget the past. And you're going to say that, you know, history started in the 1960s and everything else was just a period of darkness before the 1960s. Or before the 1990s because of the Zoomers, the uh, the woke Zoomers, it's the 1990s. So, um, Kiefer's saying, no, you have to go back. You have to ignore history completely. You have to go to prehistory. You have to go to something so much more primordial and profound and deeply recessed within our genetic and spiritual memory experiences that are ingrained in our souls and through this we can find meaning so yeah this has the, been the painting the orders of the night by anselm kiefer mm, goodbye